Hello everyone, welcome to our next lecture. So today we're going to be looking at our immunogenetics, and we're going to be looking at how antigen receptors are generated. So I would say this lecture is probably one of the more complicated ones. It might be a little slow at times, but just go through it and uh, you guys will learn something. And it's pretty important to understand, and it kind of is, is the reason we have such effective adaptive immunity in the first place let alone the function of these cells, these kind of allow us to actually have responses to the so many different things that we encounter. So gene rearrangement results in this antibody diversity. So the coding and assembly of antibody molecules. So we have randomly chosen variables, which is the V segment, diversity or D segment, and the joining J genes. So we'll see this V, D, J quite a bit through this lecture. So these combine to form an RNA transcript, which then translate into a protein chain. Two heavy chains and two light chains are used to assemble into an antibody molecule forming a constant FC region fragment, or the FC fragment, and a variable region part, the FAB fragment. So here, basically it's usually just said these are the FAB fragments and these are the FC. And then we also have our heavy chain. We can see here heavy chain and light chains. So the light chains are kind of like the inside of the Y and the heavy chains is the rest. And here we can see the common domain, which we'll talk about later, and then our variable domain. So the common domain is the same for different types of classes. So IG, M will have a certain common domain, hence the word common, while the variable region will change depending on each um, pathogen or epitope that it binds to. So early theories about antibody production looked where there was Elrich's side chain hypothesis, which proposed B cells had many side chains, like antigen receptors, which are formed before encounter with antigen. Then we have the instructive hypothesis, which proposed that antibody is a blank template with no antigenic specificity at all until it encounters an antigen. This idea was that idea was that encounter with antigen caused antibody to change its conformation, so it would bind to antigen well. We'll see that it actually. Here's another one. We have Dreyer and Bennett, which proposed that the variable and constant regions of antibodies were products of two different genes. A radical depart these was a radical departure from ideas at the time. It was the idea of two genes for one polypeptide chain went against the one gene, one polypeptide dogma. They also proposed there were several variable regions, genes, and one constant region gene. And they also that the V and C regions would need to be assembled to allow synthesis of one protein, a chain and antibody molecule. So here's another theory from Takanawa and Hosumi. So DNA from the mature antibody producing B cells from melanomas, myelomas, was compared to DNA from non-antibody producing embryonic cells. So in the embryonic cells, the K L, L chain gene was detected on two different DNA fragments. In antibody producing B cells, the K L chain gene was detected on only one DNA fragment. Interpretation of this was that the V or variable and constant regions must be separated at a large distance in the germline configuration. But antibody producing B cells had undergone DNA rearrangements to bring the V and C genes close together. So we have gene rearrangements and B cells generate this diversity. So our variable genes are constructed from gene segments in a series of gene rearrangements. We have the joining of the C regions, which generates a light chain or a heavy chain. So we have a variable light, constant light, or a variable heavy, constant heavy. So one guys, you, you can check out this uh, thing on nature. Again, nature has so many good resources is the milestone antibodies so you can go through here and work through how antibodies were discovered and different key uh, discoveries in the field here's a good one if you just search immune immunology wars actually a, a billion antibodies this is a great little animated video to talk about our antibodies definitely check it out so where do these b cell arrangements occur so here we can see the stages of b cell maturation so here we have their names Stem cell from a pro B to pre B, immature B, mature B, and memory B. Here we can see the expression and the VDJ rearrangement. We'll talk about this kappa and lambda later. 
So here we can see it's showing when the VGD gene rearrangements occur and different differences in membrane immunoglobin expression at each stage. We'll also see this later, mu positive, which relates to the IgM. So did the germline organization of immunoglobin lighten heavy chain loci in the human? So here we got a figure of our immunoglobin heavy and light chain loci. So here are all the different variations. Here are our lambda light chain locus, kappa light chain locus, and our heavy chain locus. So we can see here there are two classes of L chains, lambda and kappa. The lambda L chains locus has 29 to 33 functional variable regions, 4 to 5 J segments, and constant lambda genes, which are varies between individuals. The kappa light chains locus has about 38 functional VK gene segments and a cluster of 5J segments and one constant gene segment. So you can see these different numbers is how we rearrange, but we'll get to that later. The heavy chain locus has about 40 variable heavy gene segments, a cluster of 23 DH segments and 6JH segments and a cluster of 9CH. So these numbers aren't completely important, but it's just to give a give you guys an insight to how much variety there can actually be and the numbers that are involved. So there's almost the math involved in understanding the probability and the of how we get a unique antibody. So light chains. So we have our vein gene segments, which generate the V, v region of the L chain. We have our constant gene segments, which is the C region of the L chain. Then we have our heavy chains, which involve V, D, and J gene segments, which generate a V of an H chain. The C gene segments are the C, result in the C region of the H chain and determine the antibody isotype. So that's very important. As we discussed, there was Ig, M, A, G, D, and E. And then we have variation in these gene segments as well. So there's variation between individuals. And there's also many pseudo genes which are not included in this table. So again, we have our V, D, J, and C. So J for joining, diversity, variable, and constant. So these are kind of, again, as I discussed, this potential math involved, so it's just important to keep these numbers in. So kappa, lambda, and our heavy chain. So how is it possible that we can have over a million different antibodies? So this is a schematic representation of the genomic organization of the human kappa light chain locus on chromosome 2. So in humans, we have two immunoglobulin and kappa variable region clusters, which are separated by intervening DNA. While there are 76 kappa V region genes, aka gene segments shown here, many more are non-functional pseudogenes, which are shown in red. So only 34 to 38 of these are truly functional. And there are also five immunoglobulin kappa, immunoglobulin, yeah, J genes, and one C gene. And you can see these in green and in red. So the green are the functional genes and the red are pseudogenes. So you can just see the complexity and the amount of different variability that's possible just on this one chromosome. So we also have somatic recombination, which generates further diversity. So variable region segments are constructed from v, both V and J gene fragments in the light chain and V, D, and J in the heavy chain. So that's just remember V and J, light, V, D, J heavy. So if someone talks about VG day, VDJ, you can know they're talking about this. B cell gene arrangements. So our variable regions are constructed from gene segments and a series of gene rearrangements. The joining to this constant regions generates a light chain or a heavy chain. So again, here we have VL and CL, which we'll see quite often, and our VH and CH. So here again, we can see the process down here. So again, this is a good figure to see. We can move down. Then we have a VL and CL, and then we have a function. So immunoglobin gene expression. So in our gene rearrangements, we go from our genomic DNA, then we have our primary transcript RNA, then our mature messenger RNA. Then we can have this transplant stage, translation of the protein. So proteotypical gene encoding a transmembrane protein is what's seen in this figure. So the leader sequence codes for a signal peptide at the NH2 terminus. This directs the peptide to the endoplasmic reticulum, then to the Golgi apparatus, then to the cell membrane for surface expression. 
So this is a good statement here. Antibody structure meets diversity. So each light chain has one variable in one constant region. So this is denoted as VLCO. VL is encoded by two gene segments, the V and J. And our total L chain involves the V, J, and C. And we also have VGJ recombination through the enzyme VGJ recombinase. So here we can just see the structure of the molecule, the FC regions, and our FAB regions. And we see this is where antibody binding occurs. FAB. So variable, variable region segments are constructed from V and J gene fragments, forming the L chain, and the VDJ gene fragments are the heavy chain. So now we'll take a look at the light chains. So the light chain, there are 34 to 38 variable kappa genes, five J kappa genes and one C kappa gene. And there's one variable kappa gene joins with one gene J kappa gene. So Again, this is randomized, so only one of this amount and one of these amount will bind together. So here's a close-up of the variable kappa gene rearrangements. Here we can see the intervening of unarranged gene segments, which are cut out. So you can see here, this will form, and then this will be excised. And then you can see here, VG day recombinase, and then we have our V1, V2, J4, J5. So again, here are our numbers just for a rearrangement, for a reminder. So rearrangements generate diversity. So again, one variable gene segment is joined with a J gene, and our VJ gene recombination occurs, which is carried out by VDJ recombinase enzyme complex. So genetic events leading to the synthesis of human kappa light chain, we can see here in this example, we have a V2 to J4 gene. Rearrangement is occurring. So here we can see all the different variations. So this is just made short, but you can see N approximately 40, one to five. Then we have our rearrangement take place. Now we only have our V1, V2, V4, and J5. Then we have our transcription. And then we see here the primary RNA transcript. So again, same figure here, but now we can see the mature messenger RNA and then our kappa chain polypeptide. So the primary RNA transcript contains a selected variable kappa and J kappa and C kappa genes. Then we have our splicing. This removes the leader sequence, which you can see here, our leader sequence. You can see the difference between here. If the kappa gene segment, kappa gene rearrangement is not successful, B cells then tries the lambda del chain gene. So our B cell rearrangement always start with our kappa gene. Sometimes it will retry this kappa gene, but if not, it will move to the lambda gene. So it's kind of our backup, essentially. So again, our variable genes are constructed from gene segments in a series of gene rearrangements. So now I'll move on to the heavy chains. As we see here, heavy chains. So each heavy chain has one variable region and three constant domains. So again, denoted as VH and CH. The VH is encoded by three gene segments, the V, D, and J segments. And in total, the H chain involves V, D, J, and C. And again, we use this V, D, J recombinase. So here, sorry, this is our heavy light. We can see here, that's why it's circled. Here's a Get rid of picture there. So we have genetic effects leading to synthesis of a heavy chain. So again, here we can see the variation in the different numbers. So we have 30 to 40, 38 to 46 variable heavy genes, 23 DH genes, and 6 JH genes. So we do in this rearrangement, we have two gene rearrangements are needed. So one VH gene joins with the one DH gene and then one GH gene. So we can see here that B cell becomes rearranged. Then we have alternative splicing, which is used to make both IgM and IgD. So pretty much all naive T cells start off by developing IgD and IgM compared to the other ones we talked about, like IgG and IgA, IgE. Those are formed later through isotope switching. 
But as a result, they are both initially expressed on naive, naive B cells on the surface. They're not secreting their antibody yet, but it's on the surface. So here we can see this donated by C delta and C gamma, I mean C mu. So you'll see the noted that mu is related to IgM and delta is to IgD. These are just another nomenclature, but you can see they have their specific factors that makes them unique. They got a constant mu gene and a constant delta gene. And you can see that up here as well. You can see in this order, we'll get to it later, but we can see there's gamma, alpha, and epsilon. Those are related to the other isotypes. So you can see that these are first in the transcription pathway. So these are why these are taken first. But then we'll have isotype switching later with these genes. So the variable genes are reconstructed from gene segments in a series of gene rearrangements. The V to J segment joining is determined by the variable region of the light chain. This is joined to a constant region to determine the total light chain sequence. Again, VLCL. VDJ segment joining determines the variable region sequence of a heavy chain. Joining the C regions determines the total heavy chain sequence, VH and CH. So some key features of B cell rearrangement. So the VG day recombinase is really a complex of enzymes. These are very important proteins that you guys will remember because they're involved in some diseases as well. So we have RAG, which is recombination activating genes 1 and 2. So 1 and 2. VG day recombinase. So we encode RAG1 and RAG2. These are key players in the VG day recombinase complex. So RAG1 and RAG2 are expressed in developing lymphocytes only at stages when antigen receptors are undergoing gene rearrangement. So they're not always present. Mutations in RAG genes can cause impaired gene rearrangements in B and T cells and cause severe immunodeficiency def diseases. So this can cause something called hyper-IgM, which we'll talk about later, which basically results in a lack of uh, isotype switching because you can only produce the most simplest uh, immunoglobulins. But anyways, we'll talk about that later. So the RAG or VGD recombinase work in combination with several other enzymes to carry out the gene rearrangement process forming the VGD, VDJ recombinase complex. So again, we have a close-up here of the V-kappa gene rearrangements. And we can see that the RAGs, we can see that it's also showing the joining of the Ig, V and J gene segments by the RAG and additional enzymes in the VGD recombinase complex. So this scissors indicates the endonucleus activity of the RSS heptadimers. So see that right here. So RAG1 and 2 work in combination with several other enzymes to carry out the gene rearrangement process in the VGD, VDJ recombinase complex. I keep messing that up, sorry guys. And this includes DNA repair enzymes that cut and ligate the DNA strands to create the joints between the VDJ gene segments. So we can see that here, RAG1 activating. Here you see the scissors indicating the incisions or cutting. We'll talk about TDT later, but just keep that in mind. So RAG1 and RAG2 recognize recombination signal sequence, or RSS. So an RSS has three components. So the RSS has a palindromic heptamer, an AT-rich nanomer, nanomer, and it also has a spacer of either 12 or 23 base pairs. The nucleotide sequences of the heptamer and nanomer Nonomer are essential for the VGDJ recombination to occur. This is need, these are needed for the red complex recognition. We can see this here. So the VGD recombination is precisely targeting, targeted to the IGV, IGD, and IgJ segments by recombination single sequences, or the RSS, which is flanking each gene in the germline immunoglobulin DNA. So you can see here, flanking. So RSS has conserved heptamer and nanomer sequencing flanking the V, D, and J gene segments. The heptamer and nanomer protein portions of the RSS are separated by a spacer. That's important. Um, the reg 1 and reg 2 binds to this RSS. The length of the RSS spacer is important in controlling which recombinations occur. So 
when this recombination occurs, it must follow the 1223 rule, which we'll talk about in the next bit. But this is important, and you can see this here. 23 must be followed by 12 or 12 to 23. You won't have a 12 and a 12. This won't happen. But that's just a rule. You can see that here. You can have two 12s back to back, back behind the D segment, but they're not connecting. So the arrangement of the 1223 BP spacers in the RSS of immunoglobin genes. In heavy chain genes, the V and J genes are flanked by RSS with a 23 BP spacers but D genes are flanked by an RSS with a 12 BP spacers, like we saw in the figure. Here's our 23 and our 12. The length of the RSS spacer is important in controlling which recombinations occur. Again, we have the 1223 rule, which means a gene segment flanked by 12 BP spacer RSS can only join to a gene segment flanked by 23 BP spacer RSS. So in the heavy chain, our D segments have a 12 BP spacers on both sides. So here we can see that. The V and J segments have 23 BP spacers on both sides. As a result, the V and D segments can join, but the D and J segments cannot join. Oh, sorry, the D and J segments can join. So here we can see D and J, V and D, but not V to J in the heavy chain. So this 1223 rule prevents incorrect segment formation. So the arrangement of the 1223 BP spacers in the RS of immunoglobin genes. So in the heavy chain genes, the V and J genes are flanked by the 23 BP spacers, as we see here. While the D genes are flanked with RSS, 12 BP spacers on each side, as we saw again. In the light chain genes, the variable segments are flanked by RSS with 23 BP spacers, and J segments are flanked with 12. So joining can occur. So in the light chains, we can have V to J, but in the heavy chain, we don't. We can only have V to D and J to D to J, as we discussed right here. The role, so again, we'll take a look at the role of the RSS. So the red complex binds to the 23 BP spacer in one RSS and to the 12 BP spacer in the second RSS, bringing together the two RSS following the 1223 rule, ensuring gene segments occur in the correct order. So here we can see our 23, 12. So it's functioning in the correct order and knows where to go. So here we can see the arrow. This allows it to guide it. And even here, when we have this, we can it's still guiding it. So here you can see it's kind of color-coded. But yeah. So DNA is broken at the ends of the heptamer sequence in the orange. And the, then ligated. The unneeded region is joined. This is when it joins up here. It's joined and the red complex binds to the 23 BP spacer in one RSS and to the 12 BP spacer in the second RSS. Bringing together the two RSS following the 1223 rule, ensuring the gene segments occur in the correct order. So here we'll take a look at the steps in VDJ rearrangements. So enzymatic steps in the RAG-dependent VDJ rearrangement. So this process involves the RAG recombinase enzymes, DNA-dependent protein kinases, or DNA-PK, Artemis, which is a cool name for an enzyme, or cool nuclease, we have DNA ligase and our DNA repair protein XRCC4. And you can see most of these in this figure if you want to take a closer look. The reaction that recomb recombines V, D, and J gene segments involves both lymphocyte specific, which means RAG, and ubiquitous DNA modifying enzymes. So here's just a close up of the figure. So here our germline configuration. Our RAG1 and 2 binds to the RSS. Synapsis of the RAG complexes, cleavage of the RSS. See, we can see this part's removed as we can follow the figure down. Then we have our coding joints here, and then our signal joints. So, again, here's further steps in the VGDA combination. So, we had our coding joints like we saw above. So, this is the figure continued. Now we have our DNA PK and Artemis, which opens the hairpin, which are these little things there. <laughs> Hard to see. Then our TDT will process the DNA ends, and TDT is terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase. Then we have our DNA ligases, as we said, XRCC4, which ligase DNA ends. So you can see that. And then we have an imprecise coding joint. We also have this pathway, 
where again we use the DNA ligase. We can see, and then we have precise signal joint. So again, you can guys look at the differences between the two pathways, but it's good to know when certain uh, important molecules such as TDT and Artemis can get involved. So now we're just going to take out some immunodeficiencies, which can put some of the stuff you learned in context. So skid or severe combined immunodeficiency, an example would be when we lack of reg genes or protein kinases or PKUs or Q or Artemis, which can result in a block in lymphocyte development at each stage. So again, we saw these important, all these important molecules. If all of a sudden we don't have Artemis, then it's not going to work. Same if we don't have Rag1, etc. So some can make small numbers of B cells and T cells, or we can have a complete failure of the system. So one example is Omen syndrome, where Rag1 and Rag2 mutations occur in humans. So each B cell uses only one set of VGJ, VDJ genes for heavy chains and one set of JV genes for light chains. So again, a single B cell produces only an immunoglobulin of only one antigenic specificity. So we also have a Lee exclusion, where immunoglobulin chains are encoded by only one set of genes. Genes from only one parental chromosome are used for the heavy or an L chain. That's important, again, to help with our diversity. So how is our diversity generated? So before we even contact the antigen, we have combinatorial diversity, which is due to the random joining of multiple inherited gene segments, which result in different combinations. This is due to the different H and L chain combinations that we've inherited. We also will have junctional diversity, which is a variable addition and subtraction of nucleotides, which we'll talk about later, at junctions between gene segments, and this causes diversity of the third HVG region. So here are changes in immunoglobin genes in the B cell's life. So these are kind of just all processes that result in diversity. So here we've talked about these two processes before, isotype switching and sympathetic hypermutation, but these are later processes. And again, it's important to look what's reversible and irreversible. So here we have the V gene assembly from the gene fragments, Generation of our junctional diversity. Then we have our transcriptional controlling elements. Transcription of activated co-expression of IgM and IgD, which we talked about earlier in our naive cells. But yeah, we'll get to these in detail later. So as we discussed, there's a lot of numbers involved in this. So there is a kind of a field about antibody math, which looks at the generation of diversity in B cells in the heavy chain. So again, we talked about our combinatorial joining. So heavy chains, for example. Again, this is example only. Don't get bogged down. So again, there's 40 variable regions, 25D regions, 6J genes. This is 6,000 possible scenarios where we can have one specific uh, receptor for one specific uh, antigen. So this means different variable regions possible for the heavy genes, so 6,000. But it doesn't stop there. So for our light chains, we have 40 kappa and 5J. 40 times 5 is 200 different kappa light chains. So for lambda, there's 30 lambda, 30 V regions, and 4J. So again, that's 120. So again, we every antibody has a light and heavy. So again, that's even more variability. So again, we have our 6,000 heavy chains, 320 possible L chains. And the combination of the VH and VL domains forms an antigen binding site. So therefore, 320 times 6,000 equals 1.9 times 10 to the 6 different possible antigens. But it's not over yet there either. We can also have random assortment of the H and L chains, which causes more diversity. So factors that also contribute to further antibody diversity include, here's good figures to describe them, but here we can also have combinatorial joining, which is a combinatorial rearrangement of V, D, and J genes, which results in more diversity. We have random assortment of H and L chains, where the H chain and L chain pairing contributes to diversity. We have our junctionite diversity, which is the imprecise joining of V, J, or V, D, and J genes, aka junctional flexibility. We have insertional diversity, where nucleotides inserted at the V, D, or D, J junctions result in N region diversity, which is the N nucleotide and P nucleotide addition. And the most important for third hypervariable look is the CD3, CDR3 region. So again, here's just a look at some different diversity mechanisms. So junctional diversity. 
So the third hypervariable region, CDR3, which is complementary determining region 3, in the light chain is located at the joint between the V and J gene segments. In the heavy chain, it's partially encoded by the D region. So CDR3 diversity is increased by the P and N nucleotide addition. So P nucleotides are palindromic sequences added to the ends of the gene. RAG produced DNA hairpins, which again we can see here. DNA hairpins at coded ends of the V, D, and J segments. And then Artemis, which is here. Artemis cleaves at a random point at the single-stranded tails. The DNA repair enzymes fill in the complementary nucleotides on the single-stranded tails, and cause, which are short palind palindromic sequences. We can also have N-nucleotide addition, we can see here, by TDT, which is terminal dioxynucleotidyl transferase. So TDT adds nucleotides during the VDJ rearrangement process, which generates additional diversity. So you can see here, it just kind of adds in new strands. It adds non-coding N-nucleotides to the single-stranded DNA at junctions where D and J and VDJ genes join. This repairs enzymes and trims and synthesizes complementary DNA, which causes the ligate. The most co this is most common in V to G and D to J junctions. Further this further contributes to variation in the final structure of the antibody, variable region, influencing the specificity of the antigen. So TDT is expressed only on the early stages of B-cells, in the pro-B-cell stage. This is while it's located in the bone marrow. So that's something to know. So some of these things need to occur in the early stages. And if they leave, let's just say it doesn't happen, they won't happen unless they enter back into the bone marrow. But that's likely not to occur as they mature. So again... TDT is expressed only in the early stages in the pro B cell. So here we can see, if it doesn't occur in the stage, here we can see that D to H, J to H. So after that, we won't have any more TDD. But in mice, TDD expression correlates to the stage where pro B cell rearranges IgH chain, immunoglobin heavy chain gene. So the H gene encoding joints, which is the V to J, D to J junctions, show most added N nucleotides. The light chain genes are rearranged in the pre-B cell after TDT expression codes ends in mice. We do not see this added N nucleotides in mice. And relevant to us in humans, however, the pre-B cells do express TDD and contributes to antibody diversity in both the heavy and light chains. And we do see the N nucleotides added in coding joints of both H and light chains. So the expression of TDD during B cell development correlates with the incidence of N nucleotide addition. So again, in mice, you can read here, but we'll skip to the humans. So in humans, TDD is expressed on both pre and pro B cell stages. So the N nucleotide addition is seen at both the VDJ immunoglobin heavy chain and the VJ light chain coding joints. So here we can see TDD. No, yes, no, no. This is the mouse. So we said earlier, it's only expressed on the pro B cell. But in the human, TDD, not in the lymphoid stem cell, but it's located both on the pro and pre B cell. And then you can see here, in the immature B cell is not no longer present. So again, here's our addition here. We can see all the different types of things. So what's our estimated potential repertoire? So we estimate that they range from 110 to the 8th to 110 to the 11 different antibody combinations. So all this diversity and all these mechanisms that we see here give us essentially billions of combinations. And this allows us to pretty much essentially have an antibody to respond to anything we could ever encounter. And that's why if you watch that nature video, it kind of hypothesized that we'd even be able to detect aliens, alien life form cells just because of the diversity. But yeah. So here's a figure we looked at earlier. So the events of diversity, the process, nature, and does it occur in B and T cells? So this is a good, this section right here is good to compare when we look about T cells and B cells. As we know, these are the things we just learned about. And we can see here that T cells don't evolve in this. So they have similar rearrangements when we look at the VJ and transcriptional activation and diversity. 
So that's a good thing to know. But T cells don't have switch recombination or the somatic recombination DNA. We don't have somatic hypermutation. So once they kind of develop their unique features, they're kind of done. They don't change again. And there's no ex expression on the surface of immunoglobulin. And their membrane excreted form, these are only, these are much different compared to B cells. So yeah, that's the end. Next time we'll start to dive in to how these cells work. So I hope you guys learned something. This lecture is <laughs> a little bit dry and a lot of terminology. But again, the whole point of this is just the diversity. That spelling. Diverse, <laughs> diversity of antibodies or B cells. And we'll see later that this diversity relates to the B cell receptor and the antibodies themselves, which again are both similar. And then we can see that we'll look at T cells diversity as well and how, again here, quite similar in the first steps, but the processes after that are quite different, and we'll get into that. Anyways, thank you guys. See you next time.